Got you good with it. Let's kill this. Let's finish this, guys. I, I need to sleep. Okay. So, I guess you played with it, and if you didn't, you're probably not going to start playing with it now. Um, where is my slideshow? Sorry. I lost my... No, this is not the one. Oh. There you are. Perfect. F. Okay. Yeah, that was the exercise. Experiment with different strategies for restarting both supervisor and worker. Break. And dealing with flaky integration points. So this one is going to be more theoretical than practical because all the practical aspects of it are going to be bundled with the next block. Um, also, disclaimer, this section is heavily inspired on Mike Nygaard's release it. If you haven't read that book, do yourself a favor and check it out because it's really awesome how he distills all the information there. Um, okay. So he, there's a definition of different characteristics of your software to start mentioning different states. Like applications are not black and white. They're gray at times, right? Like it's not like completely down or it's completely up or unhealthy. You have uh, different kinds of things that can happen to a system that starts degrading in it as the time progresses, right? And those are the kind of things like what are the things that made my software degrade over time if I don't pay attention. Uh, the vocabulary that um, the book that Mike, I just recommended a second ago uh, talks about impulses as one characteristic that happens when you get all the word in your server at once. Say you have a sale at midnight, you're going to start selling PS4s at $100 and you have a stampede of things going your way. That's what it, it causes an impulse on your system and your system goes local, right? That's, um, those are really easy to explain. Like you see the amount of traffic coming in and you say, okay, I, 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 those are um, more, not, not saying they're trivial, but I'm saying you're able to figure out what's going on and you can do so much about that, right? Like you have uh, uh, horizontal scalability and uh, auto scaling groups to deal with those kinds of things. Um, you have strain, which is a bit more complicated. Uh, where you have something causing stress over time to the system. Say you're relying on another system for an API, and for some reason that system goes half capacity. So your system starts to go slower because the other system starts to get slower as well, right? Like because it's going half capacity, the responses, um, the latency is higher because it's, uh, the server is responding to many other things, right? Um, when you start to having a lot of strains, it produces cracks on your software. You can start seeing the cracks of, oh, the memory is starting to go up. Oh, the CPU is starting to go up, right? When you say the CPU going up, it's like, oh, is this uh, because it's PC doing algorithms or is this garbage collection just going crazy because it cannot keep up with the amount of stuff that is building up, right? So a lot of cracks start to break the application and something called cascading failure starts happening. Like that starts to propagate to other parts of your system because your system is suspecting certain behavior is not happening. And that's what we were talking about a second ago with supervision trees. You have different parts of the system start to fail. If you don't have supervision trees, for example, and you're running everything on the same thread, as soon as one of those systems fails, everything else fails, right? Um, we want to avoid that as much as we can. So, how do we see strain on an application? The application becomes unresponsive. Um, it's not functional anymore. Business is not happening because your application is not uh, delivering the value that it's supposed to deliver. Um, spikes on different metrics of your system. The read uh, of the files start to go up, or the RAM starts to go up. Um, excess IO rate to the database, right? 
Um, so there's uh, three different uh, terminologies. Fault, a condition that creates an incorrect state in your software. So a lot of times you have software that, despite best efforts, ha is faulty because, oh, you didn't account for this particular edge case. Haskell is particularly good at mitigating this kinds of errors because as long as you have warnings up uh, checking all the pattern matches, you will know that you're dealing with all the edge cases. And as long as you're not using partial functions, you know that you're dealing with edge cases scenarios, at least on the data structure side of things. Errors is visibly incorrect behavior, something that doesn't work the way it's supposed to, and failure is a non-responsive system. Um, so, as I mentioned before, cracks propagate. Uh, fault, uh, triggering a fault opens the crack, faults become errors, and errors provoke failures. That's how the cracks propagate. Uh, common source of strain, lack of timeouts and ongoing requests. That's the number one thing that you can do differently and that will make a huge difference. What happens when, as I mentioned before, I have a domain that is responding every request 10 seconds later. And I'm assuming that I'm managing more than one domain at a time. It starts to propagate, it starts to accumulate more workers and all the other domains are not being visited because my workers are busy with the slow one, right? If I don't have a timeout, maybe they stay for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, right? And they start to build up and availability starts to go down and your system becomes responsive, right? As soon as you add a timeout with something that makes sense, uh, those fail fast, they're reported as errors and your system continues. Yes, your system failed, but it recovered from the failure and is ready for business again. Um, resource pools get strained because of failures on lower layer of the stack. Um, like in this pool of workers, if there's um, contention or if there's locking because of timeout, like because of things being slow on a downstream level, things are gonna start to clock, right? Resource allocation exhaustion, how many open file ports can your program have at a time? Starting to consider all these different things, like what is the maximum I can push this um, algorithm and when it's gonna start breaking, right? Um, a lot of people, me included at times, don't exercise to the maximum and just like hit it with everything just to see it fail. When did it fail? Uh, no limiting on size of resources. You have a TQ with no boundaries. What are you expecting to happen when you have a million links on the crawler going? Right? Like, memory is finite. And at some point, your workers need to stop working if there's a lot of work, right? In that case, you have to, if, you, if that happens often, then you need to consider a distributed solution. You need to consider a queue that lives on its own host, and you have workers from different machines reading at that queue, right? SQS sounds like a great, great idea at that point. No limit size of SQL queries. A lot of times happens that you're testing stuff on development, on QA, hey, everything passes, chip it, but then the sizes in production are 100,000 times more bigger, right? bigger than, right? And suddenly you have a non-limit on your query, you load all the database into RAM, and you cause strain around everything else because everything else requires RAM in order to work. Right. Um, so timeout, talking about timeouts, if you're starting to see unresponsive systems, if you um, start hitting some resource and the resource is failing more than once, like say twice or thrice, the possibilities of that failing again are really, really close to one, right? Um, also, when you're retrying things, when things are starting to work again, you don't want to stampede the resources, right? Like say you have five workers waiting for something and suddenly, or not five, like 100 waiting for something to happen. It happens and all of them is like, yes, I can now request the stuff that I need and all of them do it at the same time. So you cause an stampede of requests into the server and you start to crack it, right? So specify a, hey, uh, after this condition is met, add a jitter of time there. Add like a jitter of say a second, three seconds, just so that all the requests happens at different times. Second, three seconds, it's an example, 
but it's not like a final solution. It depends on the systems and how much they take to respond, right? Things, th this thing sounds really obvious in, in hindsight, but this stuff that we normally don't do because we have to think about it and think really hard. Uh, and sometimes we just want to get stuff done and not think about it, right? But it's really important as soon as you're starting to deal with a request to a server, as soon as you start to connect into a database, consider the fact that the database is going to go slow, right? That could happen. Um, secret breakers. This one is particularly good. Uh, this abstraction keeps track of a state of third-party systems. If a third-party system fails a number of times specifying a configuration, the breaker is marked as open, meaning any request is going to be failed immediately. So it's, it's an example of fail fast. As soon as you know something is going to fail, don't wait for a timeout to hit in order to call it failure. You're wasting resources then. Just fail it fast. And every time a new request comes in, if a, period, if a grace period has passed, do a canary request. If did that fail again, okay, keep it close again. If it, so keep it open again. If that uh, canary request succeeds, then open it and continue, right? Um, more or less that algorithm, which I, I got the, is anyone familiar with Hystrix from Netflix? So it's, this is a simplified version of Hystrix. Hystrix has way more things in it. But the idea is simple. You have an IO action here, and um, you wrap it on another IO action that keeps state on this circuit breaker. And uh, the first step of the algorithm says, is this circuit breaker open? Yes. Do you have a fallback value in case the circuit breaker is open? Yes. OK, return that. Happy face. Their circuit breaker is open? No. Or sorry. Is there a fallback value for whenever the circuit breaker is open? No, then throw the exception and fail. Once the circuit breaker is uh, closed and you know it, you call the actual function that you want to call. Does the function fail with an error of some sort? Yes. Do you have a fallback? Yes, just return that. Otherwise, fail. Do you have a timeout after this, this uh, algorithm start running? Yes. Then if you have a fallback, return that. Otherwise, fail. Uh, and at the happy, happy end of the spectrum where everything works, you just return the happy face, right? Um, any questions around this? Where? This one, uh, timeout yes, fails with an error yes. So if, if fails with an error is no, it goes to timeout. If timeout is yes, then you are not able to perform the, uh, what you are trying to do because it takes too much time. Let me go back to as fallback? Yes. I see. Otherwise, it just returns the value. Right? Um, the solutions on this, uh, Secret Breakers and Haskell, are not great, I got to admit. Um, there's a library called Glue that implements a Secret Breaker that is, it works, uh, but there's no telemetry in it. Uh, it's really, like, it works on LTS 8 or 9, it doesn't work on latest LTS. So this is personally something I want to improve the same way I did Capitas. I want to build a Secret Breaker library that is actually good. Um, but yeah, like I added an example of circuit breaker in the project and, uh, the idea is testing that circuit breaker. I rely, I, co I basically copy paste the circuit breaker code from that library into the project and make use of it. See if that goes. Um, so timeouts, every time you're using an allocated resource, use a timeout, even on DB connections. Um, you don't want to have to block your system. As soon as you don't have timeouts, your threats block. If your threat blocks, your system becomes unresponsive. If your system becomes unresponsive, business value is not being delivered. It's better to fail fast, get ready for the next piece of work. Right? So one question, on the web crawler, what happens if the, um, is there any timeout strategy on the, on the web crawler that we saw a second ago? No. 
So I added a um, change that I haven't pushed to the repo that specifies a timeout for the workers. So if the workers take this amount of time, just fail them, right? Because you don't want to block your workers for something that may never come back. Um, when your system, uh, and when interacting with third-party APIs, make sure you use circuit breakers to fail fast when third-party systems are down. Worst case scenario, uh, you have tried that um, request a few times and timeouts every time. Why are you gonna keep uh, waiting for timeouts when you know it's likely it's not gonna work? Just fail it fast, right? Circuit breakers allows you to make sure that happens. Uh, I'm, actually, it's not. It's no, just. No, I know it's not doing that now, but uh -huh. you just suggested. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, would it then reassign the the work to some other worker, or? That's a great question. Um, because I feel like most likely what's going on is the remote website is not responding. So assigning it to another worker is not going to help. No. So <laughs> at that. Exactly. At some point, you gotta make you, you gotta be uh, as a business expert. You gotta know that's the that's the scenario that is happening, and you need to make an algorithm that checks the host to make sure um, you can do the circuit breakers per host or something, right? Yeah. And you can say, hey, I have a circuit breaker for this host. Is it is it open? Yep. Okay. Don't just maybe it'll be back up tomorrow. Yeah. Like like a lot of times, what you want to do is like. The final exercise, spoiler alert, is the same crawler, but using SQS and SNS. And uh, what you want to do in those situations where you say, I have a secret breaker open for this particular domain, is I'm not going to do anything with this message. Just let it fly, right? You're not deleting the message from the queue. It's going to pop up again from AWS at some point, right? Or from other system that does queuing. And as long as the secret breaker is open, just basically going to say, nope, I'm not touching that. Keep going, right? So it stays in the queue? It stays in the queue, yeah. Up until, like... What prevents it from just adding it, you know, another worker just picking it up again? Yeah, like, if another worker picks it up and the breaker is open, it's going to skip it and it's going to go back again. Like, it, you have a way to say... Um, if, if after n amounts of times that loop has happened, send it to a dead letter queue, right? Oh, so, when, so when you take it off the queue, then you're just adding it to the end of the queue? Yeah. So it's, it's not like it's just... No, no, I'm not dropping it on the floor. I'm, I'm queuing it back. Yeah. And then if it happens, say, 10 times, and I set up business a business rule that says after 10 attempts, just send it to a dead letter queue just to see what's going on okay. or retry them later. Okay, so we're going to use something called local stack. Who's familiar with uh, local stack? Does it ring any bells? You're in for a treat because this is a really nice thing. I mentioned that we're going to do a crawler using SQS and SNS. I'm not expecting you guys to pay for that. Uh, local stack is an emulator of AWS, and you can use the same AWS APIs and the same AWS tools to a host that you run locally, and it will basically mock the service, right? For local development and happy paths, it works really well. You gotta be Amazon to replicate it the exact same way, so I'm not considering that these guys are gonna do a great job for all the scenarios, but for sanity checking, smoke testing, pretty nice. You have uh, mock testing for all these different services. API Gateway, Kinesis Dynamo, S3, Lambda, SNS SQS, etc. Today we're going to use SNS and SQS as part of local stack. Um, okay, sorry, let's just go back. Uh, local stack should be already on your machine as long as you do Docker Compose up on the Project number five. So why don't you try to do that and see if it works?
Um, so we, we have been talking from the, uh, for a um, with the crawler for a period of time now. We're going to implement uh, a supervision tree that has a crawler uh, emitter and has a, sorry a, a message emitter through SNS and it has also a consumer for an SQS queue. Does anyone know how SNS and SQS like? Uh, is, any, is everyone familiar with SNS SQS? If not, that's okay. I can explain it really quickly. Okay. Which one is SNS? SNS is um, topics where you send a message and that broadcasts to a bunch of subscribers. And the subscribers can be added dynamically. So you can say, I'm sending something to a topic and I want to send a HTTP request to this domain. I want to send an email and I want to add a job on a queue. You can have one subscription for each of those tasks. And when you send a message, it's going to fan out. That's the responsibility of SNS. SQS is a queue, what we have been talking so far. Normally, what you do in some settings, which some people consider outdated at this point, but is that you have an SNS topic and you have a queue. And when you want some business logic to get, exec get executed, you send a message to the topic. That will get to the queue. and then uh, that will trigger another event that you listen to and you wait for that, right? That's the event-driven design, basically. So we are going to do, like before, we were having just a TQ for the URLs, right? Now we're going to have a topic to say, I want to add a link to something. So you can have the queue subscriber, but also you can have other things. And I'm going to have a queue for all those links that are being included, right? And every time I pull something from the queue, I pass it to the worker, and the workers are going to send a link back to, to the topic, and that goes back to the queue. There's a drawing that I will show you in a second. Um, and we're going to do something else. We're going to use something called Toxic Proxy. Is anyone familiar with Toxic Proxy? A few people? OK, Toxic Proxy. So how do you make sure that all the things that you're doing to test reliability are really working. Are you going to wait for that to happen in production and say, yep, it worked, or oh, no, it didn't? How do you emulate um, delays? How do you uh, make sure that um, timeouts are being respected and whatnot? Do you use something like Toxic Proxy on, on integration or development environment? What this does is you specify to a server, I want to create a proxy. And this proxy is going to point to the original point I'm planning to hit. So say, in this example, um, let me go back to where is the? Um, in this example, I'm hitting uh, endpoint to access SQS and SNS API. And I want to create a proxy that's going to sit in between that uh, API and my server, and my server is going to execute to uh, request to this proxy instead. I can dynamically add timeouts. I can dynamically say made and fail. So I can modify the behavior on the fly with a CLI task. And with that, I can perform integration tests saying, hey, how does the system behave when uh, half of the request takes more than a minute? Let's figure it out, right? Like, these kinds of things are feasible with uh, Toxic Proxy. Um, and uh, what I did was having a way to set up a configuration for AWS and et cetera, and specifying the Toxics yourself in the configuration. And it does and does that automatically for you. But for that to happen, it needs to have local stack running, because we're not going to pay for AWS. And have a toxic proxy, toxic proxy server running. So why don't we start with that? Um, let's go. Do. And um, if you notice on the make files, there's a local stack there. If I do 
a dev a make dev or oh, local stack. I have a, a few things. I have a uh, list queues shows me the number of queues are created on local stack. Uh, the number of subscriptions are on, on local stack, push the queues, send a test message, and set up, which creates all the resources so my application can run. The application, when it starts, it doesn't create the queues or the topics on the fly. It just assumes something else is going to do it. In my experience, that's the best way to manage our, uh, architectures that work in cloud services like Amazon. Um, yeah. So let's start by running a few processes. The first one is uh, go to 5 and do Docker Compose up. That has a uh, local stack running. All the ports already ready. And the other one is going to be toxic proxy server. And those servers are going to be running there. Um, and with that, if I go and say, for example, make f dev local stack, oh, sorry, make local stack list queues, it's going to perform an endpoint. It's going to use the AWS CLI. Oh, I forgot to add that to the requirements. Um, try to do brew install AWS CLI or huh? pip. Okay. Um, how many people have AWS CLI installed? Okay. Um, let me see if there's an easy way to, this is where next will probably be best. Eh? Just like run it. Um, Maybe there's a binary that you that we can download. Oh. Oh. This is not good. I guess the best way to install it is yeah, like that. If you have Mac OS, you already have PIP, right? No, PIP, no. but probably because you install PIP. Okay. But it doesn't come with PIP. Okay, so you do brew install PIP and then PIP is install AWS CLI. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why don't we do that first? Yeah, I have PIP, but if I run the command, it just says do not find a version that satisfies the requirement in AWS CLI. Like, executing that command doesn't work? Like that. Yeah. Like that. Yeah, I tried that at first too. Okay, so let me know as soon as you have that because that's essential for this. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like we are stampeding the bandwidth. Yeah. So, It says so. I haven't tested it. Yeah, that I was because it, it can be pretty hairy to emulate the what? behavior of the yeah those services. Um, yeah, like again, um, for uh, the only thing I'm recommended it for, just to be clear, is uh, Q stuff. stuff and topic stuff. That is the stuff I have tried and the happy bats. Not even yeah. trying to, like if no, you. I, I, of course, I wasn't uh, <laughs> claiming it to be to be ninety-nine percent completion, but uh, just even making even a fraction of the behavior seems like 
Test. Yeah, they are saying that they're going to start um, premium service yeah, around that. I, I, I'm on the website, so and for me, it sounds kind of silly because it's like, okay, so you're going to implement AWS. If you're going to implement AWS, I just use AWS, right? I don't know. Yeah, you need to have the infrastructure on AWS if you want to pay for development. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm quite, it's quite weird that AWS doesn't have this. Like, Amazon should provide this. No. no. Amazon wants you to use the cloud. So basically, if you want the dev infrastructure, you, you deploy the dev infrastructure on, on, on Amazon. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'm not saying That's that sense. production production AWS, yes, but on my local machine, I don't want to have to have an internet connection to test the logic of my system on integration tests. It's a cloud company. Yeah. I actually think that they have, I mean, as always, they like because of the distributed model that they have, some things actually have a development alternative. I think AWS Lambda, for instance, has they have like they provide you with binaries to like simulate the Lambda mm. running yeah. Lambda, but not not everything. Yeah. The, the, the integration is not binary. Yeah. Interesting idea. Okay, so once that it's uh, set up. The way it would look like is if you do local stock setup. It will execute all the AWS CLI commands to build the infrastructure that you need for application. So it will do create queue, create two queues, create a topic, and create a subscription from the topic to the queue. Right? So Q1, uh, rather arbitrary name, is the queue that we're going to use for the URLs coming from the crawler. And the topic one is where we're going to publish the new URLs that are happening. Right? If we do now and list um, queues, it's going to tell us, hey, you have uh, Q2 and Q1 created on the local stack uh, service. Uh, OK, with that in place, if I run the application, is there anything else that I need to run the application? I don't think so. So I'm going to go and do uh, make build. I'm going to install a bunch of stuff. So this is like a conglomerate of all the things we have seen so far. It uses etc. It uses ComponentM. It uses Capitas. All in one mix bag with AWS uh, services and Toxy Proxy. So it's like a really complete example that I'm not expecting you to understand fully. And we're going to go through the code. We're going to showcase the features that we can do and what, how we can tweak things. The code is there for you to figure it out if you want to, or if you have any questions, just ask me. Um, the challenge is going to be, once that we run the application and we see how Toxic Proxy works, is adding capabilities of Toxic Proxy for SNS. The Toxic Proxy capabilities are on SQS only. Reading how SQS Toxic Proxy works, replicate that for SNS and test it. That's going to be the challenge after we finish with this exercise. And I'm expecting that to take an hour and a half because it's a lot of code. <laughs> um, yeah. And also, there's some circuit breakers there. There's timeouts there. So you can start playing with that. Or lack of. And if we add timeouts, how would it behave? OK, so. Is there a reason why there are discrepancies in the stack versions that are used, the stack version? Yeah. Uh, because Amazon Ka only works on LTS then. Yeah. It's kind of unfortunate, yeah. That's, that's the reason why I didn't do a one stack for everything. Because. OK, so with that out, if I go and execute web crawler, it's there. It's doing nothing. Why? Because there's no URLs on the queue. If on a different tab, uh, I go and I do make 
f make local stack send test message. This guy is going to add a URL into, it's going to publish a URL to the topic. That message is going to get to the queue. And then the system is going to start working. Right now, it's just a single worker, and that's why it's going to go so slow. Boom, message send. And tracing there for my own sake. Uh, but you see that it's starting to push things into it. And it's using SQS and SNS in the whole process. This guy is using the same worker pool uh, supervision tree and is fixed to one worker. We can add more workers and see how it starts to behave. Um, so the idea is I want, you to, I want you to have this program running. And after we have that program running, we're going to go together and check out uh, different things. Um, yeah, that's as interesting as it's going to get. Um, but let's, um, I kill the project. And because I'm running the main, it's just returning me a component runtime failed. This is part of component M. After the initialization of the application is done, whatever is running inside the run component M, if that throws an exception, it's going to wrap it in a component runtime failure. And it's going to return you the original error, and it's going to tell you the result of disposing everything else. Another thing that is really interesting is when I run this guy um, and I go into the toxic proxy CLI and do list, you will notice there's a proxy there. Right now, the program is not connecting directly to local stack. It's connecting through the proxy to local stack. And uh, we can start messing up the connection to SQS, making it slower, uh, having a slow close, like different different things. Let's go. Let's go through that just a sec. Um, sorry, I'm tired. Toxic proxy. So the idea is you have you have uh, proxies and you can add toxics to the proxy. What are these toxics? Uh, latency. We can say. Add a delay to all data going through the proxy. The delay is equal to the latency that I'm specifying in milliseconds, and I can specify a jitter as well to, to add variation. Down, I can emulate the services actually down. Uh, bandwidth, I can limit the connection to a maximum number of kilobytes per second. Slow close, I can uh, delay the closing of the TCP socket. Uh, this is not a form of delay, but it's just at the very end of the request. Timeout. Um, this is emulating when things are going through proxies and suddenly it just kills it, kills close it in the middle. Like what happens if you're reading something and suddenly pff, it kills it? Slicing. What happens if different sizes of the packets are coming at different rates? Some ones taking more than others. You can specify what's the average size, what's the size variation, and how much of the delay between the packets. So you have like layer three TCP tweaking and Cow's cow's introduction introduction to test that your application is resilient after those things are happening, right? Uh, limit data closest connection with transmitted data exceeds limit. So let's go and so far we have um, let's let's add a delay just to see what's what that looks like. So toxic proxy CLI, toxic, if I just do help. I didn't create a make task for this, I should have, so that you, I don't have to tell you put this particular commands in this particular order in order to work. But uh, toxic proxy uh, CLI, toxic at, yes. And I have the proxy name. If I do list, you would see that the name is q1.proxy, q1.proxy. Toxic name is a human readable toxic name. So I'm just going to call it uh, random latency. And the type is going to be one of the disguise. 
these are the different types, latency, down, bandwidth. I'm just going to say latency, attribute being um, latency equals to 10 seconds. Right. If I do that, boom, added downstream latency toxic random latency on proxy Q Q1 proxy. If I go and uh, do toxic proxy CLI inspect Q1 proxy, it's telling me uh, you have a random latency toxic in place on the proxy right now. And what that's going to cost is this guy is going to go way, way slower because now it's taking way more time to pull stuff out of the queue, right? And this is going through layer three. You can use this with any service. Um, and the software, like the Haskell project is creating the creating a proxy for each of the queues that your application is configuring, right? I will show you that, show that in just a sec. Is anyone, uh, has anyone um, be, being able to run this program on their machines? Uh, sorry about that. Um, okay, it's okay. We can go through the code and start seeing how it behaves, like how, how things work. So this, this project is not a simple file. This project is many different files, uh, most of them living in the app folder. So I have uh, the main in here, Let's start with that. Okay. Oh, brutal. There we go. And we're going to go here. Up. 